pandemic got delayed. We let we missed a few minutes the last uh, YouTube. For the first time today, somebody told me they were late because of traffic. Did they want you to do something about the traffic? No, they said they were late <laughs> to an appointment because of the traffic. And I said, really? All right, I count the quorum, Jesse, and it's 6.33. Yes, you're at a quorum. Okay, then let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the October full board meeting of Manhattan Community Board 4. I'm Lowell Kern, the chair. And our first agenda item tonight is a presentation from the one commanding officer of the four precincts that cover our district that was not reassigned in the last month. Um, so I am pleased to introduce Deputy Inspector Stephen M. Hellman of the 13th Precinct. Um, the 13th covers a small part of Community Board 4. Um, in accordance with the uh, working group that we formed in uh, back in June, we're asking all of the precincts to come through on a regular basis to try and establish better relations between the community board and the NYPD. So I'm going to turn this over to Deputy Inspector Hellman. And uh, it's all yours, sir. Thank you for joining us. Inspector, can you, uh, you're having some trouble there or, you, or can you join us? Because we can't hear you. Uh, let me try to find a way of getting in touch with him. Okay. Because it doesn't sound like you heard the introduction either. No, I don't think you did. I think he has actually audio. That's part of the problem. Not sure what to do about that. He's here with yeah, us. Well, if you don't mind going, on, continuing on, I will. Uh, let me get on the horn and I'll talk to the. Community. Okay. Well, then let's let's do something. What should be simple. I will uh, entertain a motion to adopt the agenda if someone wanted to do so. I see JD raising his hand as they go second from Christine and from Paul. All those in favor of adopting the agenda, please raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Is there Aye. anyone opposed? Aye. <laughs> is there anyone opposed to the agenda? Okay, the agenda is adopted. Let's talk about the minutes. Are there any comments on the minutes for the meeting for September? Katie, go ahead. Uh, let me just 
pull it up real quickly. Um, actually, it was just under the um, the section about uh, Derek Ingram. Um, it says, oh, darn, I have to pull it up quickly. Here we go. It says something about the fact that his apartment was raided, which it wasn't. So I think we just have to take out those few words, but otherwise the rest of it was great. Um, so I'm pulling it up right now. Um, Mike, are you getting this? Mike or Leslie? Oh, I am. But let me tell you, when I use words like raided, I'm quoting him. He okay. told us that his apartment was raided and therefore I copied it. Okay. Um, See? Okay, so right now the, the minutes read um, the, in the first sentence, like uh, it says, during which his apartment was raided by police squads attempting to arrest him on a warrant that apparently never existed. I would just say during which police squads attempted to arrest him on a warrant that apparently never existed. But his building was raided. <laughs> right. They came into his building, but not his apartment. Or you can just change the word apartment to his building if you wanted yeah. to. Mike, you okay with that? Yeah, th that's what I'm going to do. Because if we're going to uh, reflect what he said, okay. then I've got to put the word in there, okay? His okay, that's fine. His is raided. That's fine. Anyone no. else... That's fine. Unless, uh, Katie, did you have anything else? Nope. Did anyone else have comments on the minutes? I'm looking to see if I see hands. I do not. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the minutes. Move Second. to the count. I, I, I heard, I see Paul and Jeffrey a second. Jeffrey, not if you'll second it. Yes. All Thank those you. in favor of adopting the minutes, raise your Aye. hand. Aye. Is anyone opposed? Aye. Is anyone opposed to adopting the minutes? The minutes are now adopted. Thank you very much. Jesse, did we connect with the deputy inspector yet? I believe he so. I think he's got audio capabilities now. Okay. Deputy yeah. Inspector right. Hellman, are you with us? I'm here. <laughs> I did all a very right. I, I thought I did a very nice intro and you missed all of it. So uh, <laughs> But everyone else heard it. So I'm going to now turn the floor over to Deputy Inspector Stephen M. Hellman of the 13th Precinct. All right, thank you. I'm sorry I missed your introduction. It looked good. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for having me. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, have to do my crime spiel just to go over where we're at right now, which uh, I'm pleased to say we're down for the year, 11% in crime. That's 167 crimes. That, 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 that's a good place to be. Um, and when you look at the 28 day period, which is where we in the NYPD, we live in a month, so to speak, to look at crimes, patterns, trends, and we're down again, 20% uh, uh, down in every category, except for um, grand larceny of vehicles, nine versus seven. Um, needless to say, does not mean that we're not seeing, look, I walk out there, I'm walking on the streets every day, do we see issues? Yes, and I'm open when I'm done talking to hear any complaints and issues you want to bring to my attention. But yeah, quality of life concerns, definitely seeing it. Um, the homeless, um, the homeless type uh, committing random low level assaults. Um, we are up to like 21 random assaults for the month. Um, unprovoked, luckily no one was seriously hurt. Um, but yeah, I see it. Um, I'm open to uh, addressing it, which we are addressing it. We, we are working with the uh, Department of Homeless Services, uh, Consumer Affairs with the vendors. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's been an uphill battle. Uh, we go, we move them, we address it. They come back. So um, I, I'm empathetic. I understand. I'm glad we're down in serious crimes, but I, I understand there's definitely some quality of life concerns in the confines of uh, the community board as well as the 13 precinct in entirety. So with that being said, please, uh, anyone that wants to talk to me, address anything, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here, please. Um, Inspector, can you remind us what part of the 13th precinct is within our community board district area? I was hoping you could tell me that. <laughs> uh, Jesse, can you, I, I'm not sure exactly where the boundaries are. We are from, we are from a, uh, 14th to 26th Street from 6th Avenue West. Yeah, okay, yeah. 14th to 23rd. So we cover, so that's from 14th to 23rd from 6th Avenue 
to the south side of 7th Avenue. That'll be the confines of the 13th precinct. Okay, so it's that little corner. So does anyone have any questions either about that little corner of our district or more generally for uh, Deputy Inspector Hellman? I, I do. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, hi, Deputy Inspector. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Know, you. I, wanted, I wanted to ask you a question, generally speaking. You know, with okay. so, many, so many shootings happening in the city, uh, I can tell you from firsthand experience that uh, I've been able to help in that regard in, in the sense that I've had two shootings right outside my window, one in May, I was the only one to report it, and one a few days ago, the only one to report it. And the detective who contacted me said that uh, if it were not for my call in May, they would not have a suspect that they're pursuing. So I thought about this and I said, gee, there's so many people hear these gunshots, there's so many people walking around with guns, and I see the numbers are astounding numbers. Has anyone given any thought about, you know, like a crime stopper sort of thing, uh, you know, getting out to the public and saying, hey, look, if you hear shots, you got to tell us about it. That's the only way we can pick up bullet frag, you know, bullet uh, shell casings, which is what they did. They would not have had them in May had nobody called. And, you know, that sort of thing. And the other night, they, uh, you know, I'm up early. These things happen at like three, four, five in the morning. So, you know, maybe some sort of crime stopper announcement should be made to the communities because there are too many people out there firing weapons. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, well, thank you for the question. Um, where May I ask where you live? Because we have zero shots fired calls in the 28-day period. So where, where, where are you yeah. referring to? Uh, I live, uh, my window faces uh, 25th Street between 9th and 10th. And both these shootings were right underneath my window. You know, huge, yeah. huge shots, huge. I know, I'm familiar with that by the development, correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that is the 10th precinct, but it doesn't mean I can't answer your, your question. Right. Yes, it should. I don't know the statistics as far as shots fired calls in the 10th precinct, um, but I'm sure, I, actually, I know for a fact. So let's just say hypothetically, I did have a shots fired uh, call in a 20 day period. And whether it's the overseeing borough or downtown Comstat, or just a Zoom call with the executives at One Police Plaza, a shots fired call is treated like an actual shooting, like someone's actually being shot. So the reason being is we have to know why the shots were fired, are there any ballistic evidence, and a very big, um, uh, how do I put it, result of a shots fired is retaliation. So that means if there's shots fired this day and they were shot at somebody, are they going to come back the next day and someone else is going to try and uh, a retaliatory shooting? So when, utmost important, a shot's fired, even if someone's not shot. To answer your question, yes, 100%. You should, A, call 911. And B, um, what you're saying when you, uh, what was the term you used? Uh, uh, for, uh, 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 you, the question was if, you, if someone, oh, a, a shot's, um, a crime stopper. We, crime stoppers is always active and always takes uh, into account someone calling. So there, crime stoppers does exist right now. Um, I could talk to uh, the CEO of the 10th Precinct, which I think that just moved. Who's the CEO of the 10th now? It is now Captain uh, Galt. Galt. Uh, Rob Galt just became the commanding officer of the 10th Precinct, a tenured guy. I could uh, let him know about this question, and I, I could assure you, that uh, he's looking into every shots fired call. And I would hope that people are calling when they hear shots fired. I know I would, 100%. Well, let me tell you one other thing. The detective who called me the other night remembered my first name from May. That's how isolated these calls into the precinct are, or to 911. He remembered my name. Another, another I, listen, I'm just speculating right now. Another, you know, thing that might be people could be that live in the developments that you know know the players over there and i'm speculating right now and be hesitant to making a call you know on their own but that's what the nco philosophy is all about the, the nco officers in the 10th precinct i know they have a very good program they go out there they discreetly will reach out to witnesses complainants give out their card and they get comfortable with people and they get people more comfortable which they might have to do in this instance if you're really hearing uh, continuance of shots and uh, try and get people to be more uh, proactive with reporting it. 
All right, thank, thanks for your question, Mike. Paul has his hand up. Um, hi, hi, officer. Thanks for coming and joining us. Um, I asked this question of uh, CEO Coleman when he was with us last month, and I think it's not as prevalent an issue with you, but I'd like to see if I can get a conversation going amongst all the COs where the precinct lines into, uh, cross over. So particularly up here at 43rd and 9th, where the 10th, the Midtown North and Midtown South, those corners where the intersections are, the drug dealers all know where those lines are. And if they're on one side of the street and they see an officer on the other side of the street, they know they're not gonna be bothered. And I'd like to start to see a system where officers cross the street, even though it's not within their precinct, rather than calling the other precinct to get some action. And maybe setting up something where it's every Tuesday and Thursday, the 10th crosses over to the 13th, and then Wednesdays and Fridays, the 13th crosses over. The, but some way that the officers on the streets can actually take action against criminal activity if it's not in their precinct across the street. Um, well, and I know that's a hard thing to do, but. No, that's not a hard thing to do at all. And, you know, if my officers are on one side of the street and people are committing a crime on the other side of the street, I better not find out that they didn't go across the street, I'll tell you right now. Yeah, well, what we're finding is they're calling the other precinct to bring the other officer down. That, that, that shouldn't happen. And, uh, that, and, you know, it's about communication. You bring that issue up. I was the executive officer of Midtown North. I was the executive officer of Midtown South as well. Um, I'm familiar with the area you're talking about. I mean, it's about communication. It's about talking to your commander, whether it's the new, um, I think it's Megan O'Malley now in Midtown North, and it's uh, Captain Rob O'Hare. <laughs> Let me tell you, a real go-getter if you know him from the 6th. He's not letting anyone deal drugs in his precinct, I'll tell you right now. So I, to be all serious, communicating. And, the, and there is, should be never an instance where you go to an order, no, 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 that's not my precinct over there. That's unacceptable. I'd want a phone call to my personal phone if that was to happen. But not just putting a bandit to work on, I, I talk to regularly, you know, was Rob O'Hare in the six, whether it was Coleman in the 10, John um, O'Connell in the ninth. We've had a new shakeup of commanders. Forgive me if I don't rattle the name. Right, so right. Always communicating and talking about the guys, you know, the, uh, the corridors that we share. Because a lot of times they can commit a crime on my side, they're going into there. And, and we're always, always communicating. But that sounds like a quality of life issue where they you need an omnipresence and you need proactive cops there so uh, you know like again 43rd street on that corridor i could raise that to megan as well as uh, rob uh, that's not a problem appreciate it thank you you're welcome you spend some time with us thank you any, any other questions from the board for the ceo sarah appleton go ahead hi um, Inspector, thanks for being here tonight. Um, I'm sure you've seen that in recent days, there's been a lot of public discussion and media coverage on mask adoption among NYPD officers. Um, I think this is an issue that, you know, at least in my opinion, was always important, but has certainly become particularly important with COVID cases ticking up around the city and officers being charged with enforcement of mask wearing and other social distancing rules. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that I'm not alone on this board in saying that I've seen, you know, dozens of NYPD officers in our district maskless on our streets throughout the summer and fall. Um, maybe noticed a couple more, you know, every time I go out, but for the most part, most of the officers I'm seeing are still not wearing masks. And obviously that's not only a public health problem, but it further erodes trust and goodwill, I think, you know, among our community and members of the NYPD. So can you just talk about what's being done at the precinct level? Um, to encourage mask wearing and hold officers accountable. 100%, and I, I agree with you totally. Um, perceptions, reality. You know, we wear we wear these uniforms. We're representing something, and uh, not only what actually the mask does, protecting ourselves and other people. Just, you know, the 13th precinct. Just just to let you know, when COVID hit, 65% of my workforce all had COVID at the same time. Yeah. Uh, we had one death. Um, COVID is very serious. We don't take it lightly. Um, this, we know this is, you know, the, the, the question you asked has made it all the way to the police commissioner on down. So we do have a internal disciplinary action or oversight where, you know, we're telling the troops, we're checking up on the troops. You know, they have to wear their mask. I, I don't know what this, I, will you walk and see an officer you know, with his mask pulled down, probably. Do we know what happened five minutes before? Was he chasing a sub subject? Is he short of breath? I don't know. But I have to tell you, the masks are important. We have to wear them, especially when 
you know, social distancing cannot be um, used, for lack of a better term. So there is a disciplinary process going in um, from the police on down, and that, that's where we are. That's what we're can, doing. Can you describe that disciplinary process briefly? Um, I wouldn't say it comes with a, like, oh, if you're caught without your mask, we're taking this many vacation days from you. That's, that has not been implemented. I think right now it's at the importance level of me as a commander to my supervisors and to my staff, letting them know that you are going to be reprimanded, whether it's loss of vacation days, loss of assignment, you know, am I going to lie to you? Am I going to, am I going to say that every individual case is going to be taken into account? of uh, officers in the park and he just chased the perpetrator and he couldn't breathe and he's by himself social in an instance like that would i look to be disciplining one of my officers no but if an officer is pulling over a car of several cars he pulls a day and he's and he's doing summons enforcement and he doesn't have his his mask on i think that's egregious so a situation like that what would happen is we'd write what's called the command discipline which is like a paramilitary term for like a gig or a rip and then we'd go to a, a, a panel and we, we'd think about that individual basis of what would be the significant punishment. Mm -hmm. Has anyone been through that disciplinary process yet? Zero in the 13th precinct. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Zero, in the, oh, zero in the 13th. None of, okay. none of his officers, Sarah. Thank you very much for your question. Christine? Thank you. Thank you, um, officer, for being with us. It was interesting that you said if they are, uh, if he's pulling a car and talking to a driver, it's a big deal. But you know, there are a lot more pedestrian than drivers. So when they are walking next to pedestrian, that's also even more so dangerous. And I agree with you. I was just using that as, an, as a specific example. I know, I know. I'm just pulling your leg a little bit, but that's. Yes. I didn't mean to make light of another situation where you're right. If you're right. And, and people so, are. I was going to ask you a real question. The question is, you know, we understand there was a change in direction from the city about your interaction with the homeless, uh, homeless people. And it's at that point, at this point, it's very confusing to the population of what you can do and you cannot do, right? Yeah. Uh, um, and, and, you know, so the first question is, can you still pet patrol in streets where there are homeless, uh, you know, homeless uh, hotels or homeless uh, sites. Yes. And yeah. uh, 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 do you continue to patrol and at what, at what uh, intensity? Oh, well, I'll explain to you. So every 911 and 311 call and complaint I receive in the 13th precinct is addressed by my personnel. When I say addressed by my personnel, we are responding, okay? So when we respond, uh, what do we see? We see intravenous drug use. We see, no, I'm being, I'm hypothetical. Uh, crimes committed right in front of us. Guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna arrest them, okay? Take, take the next scenario. There's an encampment. So now if there's an encampment where in the past we did take immediate enforcement, but what we do is we would um, reach out to the Department of Homeless Services We'd offer them services. We'd uh, do, we wouldn't, where in the past we would take immediate enforcement, we wouldn't. So in that situation, we wouldn't. And let's just say there are homeless people congregating on the corner. Unfortunately, it's not a crime to be homeless. So once again, we'd reach out. We, we try to get them help, social services, do what we can. But unless there is, um, so to answer your question, we're responding to every 311, every 911, and every complaint to homelessness. And we're responding there, we're assessing it. And based on the egregiousness of what we're seeing, if it's a crime being committed, intravenous drug use, open alcohol container, anything like that, we're arresting, summonsing, whatever action we have to take. But if it's a quality of life, homeless person living on the street, we're gonna make every effort to reach out to social services, get them some help, and try and see if we can help them that way. I, I hope that I sort of answered your question. Right, I, I guess that helps. I just have a follow-up question, which is your NCOs or your patrol people, are they patrolling the streets? 
and and how often because i mean i think there has been in some streets and they are not yours by the way but there has been a sense of uh, uh, the absence of 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 uh, officers in the street not visible you are you talking general the, or addressing homeless conditions huh are you talking in general or at is it yeah, in a, general uh, we're <laughs> we're out there uh, the ncos uh, a patrol their sector, uh, followed by um, what's called the steady sector. That's so the, the NCOs are sort of the outreach people. They're the ones that are contacting you. They're following up on crimes. They're working with uh, the community as well as the detective bureau. And then we have uh, steady sectors. So the steady sectors stay in that area, following up on cases with um, the NCOs give them as well as answering, answering 911 jobs. And then backed up by them, is the response autos. The response auto is the autos just going around answering 911 calls and basically doing what tra traditional patrol was. So to answer your question, we are out there. If you're seeing an area that you think is lacking and needs more attention, of course, you know, I get it all the time. I think it's in your, I, I hate to bring this up, it doesn't help me, but 23rd to 24th Street on 6th Avenue, I mean, you have the vendors over there, you have a homeless condition over there, I put the light towers up. Um, I make sure that we, what we do is directed patrols on the hour. So that's like a problematic area where they're not really committing crimes, but there's quality life issues. So I'll, I'll add my, cop, my officer and personnel as much as I can. So if you see a problematic area, I don't know what precinct you live in, but you should definitely be reaching out to the NCOs, your commanding officer, and he could definitely you know, do some deployment in that area. I'm, I'm going to jump in here. I want to remind everyone that all of the precincts have community council meetings and the, the officers at each precinct are available. Um, the community affairs officer and whoever else is there for that meeting. Um, and so it's not only through this forum that you can ask questions of the NYPD. Um, and Inspector Hellman, I've got one follow up question on the mask issue that someone posted in the chat. Can civilians report mask violations of um, NYPD officers not wearing masks and how would they do that? I believe they do it. I think we get it through 311. Yeah, yeah three, they, the, the 311. Okay, so there's, if, if you see someone, an officer not wearing a mask, you can report it if you want to. I've got one more person who wants to ask a question of you and then we'll let you go. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Carrie Keenan, you're up. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll make it very quick. I've been asked to ask, um, what is the role of or mandate to the police in our community for um, ensuring the safety of the people who are exercising their right to vote on November 3rd? Just to make sure that the polls are safe, you're saying? Yeah. Oh, well, we're gonna be, we are, we are in meetings and plans. We're gonna really be uh, beefing up the personnel at the polling sites. I think we're all gonna be going, I mean, it's still, the, I think we'll, every officer in New York City is going to 12 hour tours. So, so we have uh, more coverage, um, but we're in meetings constantly about that and we're gonna make sure that they're safe. I feel very, very confident. Is, is there anything specific you can tell us? Just, just uniform presence and dealing, you know, right, you know, and, and handling the process as we do every single day. They're actually protesting Union Square Park as we speak. So we have it down very well. I mean, we went from, you know, the COVID, then we went into the looting and the riots and then to the peaceful protest process. And we, I think we handle it better than any department in the country, basically. Um, right now, you're seeing the arrests are, are much less, much less people getting hurt right now. Where initially, when it was when it was off the hook, it, it, was, it was really problematic in June, if you don't, if you recall. So I think we're going to have a strong uniform presence. I think we're ready, and we're going to keep everybody safe and make sure everyone votes. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, Deputy Inspector Stephen Hellman of the Thirteenth Precinct. Um, since we're doing a rotation, um, he'll be back with us sometime in the next few months. Whenever you want, and, you, and honestly, you could just. Whenever you want, you can email me. Um, it's, it's, when you go on, it's stephen.helman at nypd.org. Call me. My phone's attached to me all the time. Any, anything I could do for the community. Thank you so much, sir. All right. Bye-bye. All right. We're going to move to our public session now. Jeffrey, are you here? 
I am here, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, Jeffrey LaFrancois, our first vice chair, will run the public session. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you for the intro, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we'll be doing, as we always do, our public session. Members of the public who have signed up in advance or signed up um, online before 6.45 this evening will have two minutes of time to speak on a topic of their choosing. I'll be timing it and giving a 15 second warning. Uh, I'm gonna call three names at a time so that way our, our board staff, the amazing team on board staff, um, can pull folks over from the attendees into the panelists. Uh, we start this evening with Joseph Selman, followed by Ryan Brodsky, and then Amy Todorov. I don't believe I see Joseph in the attendee section, but Ryan is here, so I'm gonna add him now. Excellent. Hello, can you hear me? We can, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, so I'm, um, I guess I'm here for Astro's Dog Run, um, which is um, a little tiny slice of land in between 39 and 40th Street, um, <clears throat> where you, uh, you pick up the key from, pay $30 and pick up the key from the community board office, which is, I guess, non-existent now. Um, the dog run has been closed for a month and a half or two months, um, and um, it's very, very hard to get information about it. Um, how it's run, who runs it. Well, I know who runs it. Um, he's never there. Um, and um, I'm wondering just what's going on with it. It was closed for construction that never happened. I live at 55510 right next door. Um, and so there was no, never any construction. And now there's a listing on the door that says it's closed indefinitely. And to email Tim, Tim Ousey, who is the president of, um, of Astro's Dog Run. Um, but there's no other information. The community board has not been able to give me information. Uh, submitting to Tim doesn't give information. And I was there, you know, I've been a member for, for more than a year and was there three times a day for more than an hour at a time, um, especially during the pandemic. Um, and I've never even met Tim. Um, so I'm wondering, does the community pay for this spot? How is Tim, the, the person that runs this dog park, elected or chosen? And, um, and how do we find out more or get the dog park back open? Thank you for all that. Sounds like a relevant ask um, through which we would take it uh, through our Waterfront Parks and Environment Committee. Um, Mr. Rotsky, if you wouldn't mind following up with the board staff, we could go from there. Okay, how do I, how do, I do that? We, we, can, we can follow up with you, Ryan. We've been interacting with you. Janine and I have been, specifically Janine from my office has been interacting with you. So we can follow up and, and get that online. And we can obviously follow up with the Port Authority uh, okay. regarding any construction issues um, that, uh, out, that are outstanding. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, Amy Todorov. Jesse, did we find this person? Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Amy, go ahead. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak today. There's an important vote coming up before the city council on October 15th on open culture. It's no secret that New York City is facing an uncertain future while managing potentially massive budget shortfalls. And these bills offer a creative community-based solution for many of our biggest challenges as we look ahead into 2021. So quickly, those bills are a pair of bills. Uh, it's 2068 and 2034 that work in tandem to create a streamlined way for arts and cultural groups to activate outdoor public spaces in much the same way restaurants access open streets and will create an interactive map that lets New Yorkers see what is happening in their community. So we know outdoor activity is better for the health of New Yorkers during this COVID crisis. We also know culture not only increases quality of life, but it can revitalize economies. Every dollar spent on small cultural events has a 24% higher rate of return than the average dollar spent, and that money stays within the community, supporting small businesses. We hear an oft echoed concern that New York City's streets no longer have the foot traffic that fuels economies and these bills solve that by getting people into their community in a safe way, still beholden to all the safety protocols. And we also hear from parents who need safe outdoor activities for their children. These bills offer alternatives to screen learning through outdoor readings, classes, small scale performances, and these activities, unlike dining, do not require anyone to remove their mask. 
So allowing artists, poets, visual artists, cultural teachers to activate public spaces creates an unofficial city workforce of caretakers for these public spaces as well. The bills require that the cultural groups- seconds. Great. The cultural groups ensure the spaces are clean and well-maintained after use. That's a partnership that's a welcome relief for overburdened city agencies. So we are asking for your support on these bills. Whatever you can do, uh, write a letter, reach out to uh, your council member, which is Corey Johnson. Thank you again. Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. Next three speakers. Sorry, I can't control my alarm. Next three speakers, Guy Yedwab, Nancy Swalla, and Curtis Swalla. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Guy, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak. Uh, I'm also here to speak on behalf of those bills that Amy was just discussing, those open culture bills. Um, part of the need for being able to do this is because there's a number of cultural institutions things like small dance venues, theater venues, uh, they currently do not have the ability to operate at all. Uh, and there are still many of them on the hook for rent every month. Uh, this community board covers the most dense area in terms of cultural institutions and venues. Uh, and so providing the ability for public performance in a safe and, and uh, respectful way uh, is going to really help some of these organizations survive. Uh, I also see that Senator Jackson uh, is with us tonight, and I want to thank you for your support of uh, the rent relief bills that are currently in Albany. Uh, we'd love, uh, we, we thank you for your support on that because this, uh, this crisis has already closed a number of cultural venues permanently, uh, and many more are struggling to survive. So we, we thank the community board for any support you can have for keeping these cultural spaces able to engage with the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Apologies for my dog barking in the background. Um, Nancy, followed by Curtis. Do we have them, Jesse? We have Nancy. Yes, I, I am here. I'm actually, uh, Curtis had to leave, so I'm going to speak on behalf of the both of us, if that's okay. Thanks, Nancy. You have two minutes starting now. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just a, qu a quick introduction. Um, I'm from the Guardian Angels. Um, the Guardian Angels, uh, we're unarmed uh, volunteer community patrols. Uh, comprised of women and men. We're in 13 countries, 139 cities. We started in the Bronx in 1979, and we have patrols throughout all of the boroughs. And we want to reach out to obviously everyone in Chelsea because the goal is to form partnerships with everyone in the area um, as we're doing the community patrols. So since the lockdown began, um, the group, we've been asked to start patrols in Chinatown when uh, people were being Asians were being attacked because of the COVID and Upper West Side where um, we reside because of the increase in crime, quality of life issues. And now in Chelsea, we have several members who actually live in Chelsea and they asked, um, they wanted us to reach out and start the group in Chelsea. So now we're starting a group in Chelsea um, and they were speaking of problems in the corridor along 8th Avenue uh, between 20th and 22nd Street, like relating to um, hard drugs being dealt, people shooting up, arguing, fighting. Um, there have been a lot of complaints, obviously, of like break-ins, attempted break-ins throughout Chelsea and um, packages being stolen, things of that nature. So where our group is patrolling, and again, this is like just to give a, you know, an introduction, insight to everyone who may not know, but where we're at, it's like between 14th Street and 30th and then 7th Avenue and then to the West Side Highway. So you know, we're in the area and obviously, you know, when people reach out, sometimes they say, oh, they want to sort of uh, form, you know, figure out, oh, why are you here? What are you doing? Um, the nature of the organization is uh, individuals reach out, but obviously, you know, you want to uh, give notice of your presence to people who are active in the area. So that's really the purpose of- 10 seconds. Okay. Okay. And, and we, we, meet at, we meet every Thursday, 7.30 p.m. and on Saturdays at 1 p.m. 14th Street, 8th Avenue. But- um, you know, I, I wish you all well and keep safe, everybody. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, next up, Brian Weber, Weber, followed by Jeffrey Rowe and Alan Mark. Brian? Give me one second. Sure.
Ryan should be over. Hello? Hey, I think I've just crossed over. Can you hear me? Ryan, all you two minutes starting now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lowell um, and Jeffrey. Uh, so my name is Brian Weber. Um, I'm a resident of West 36th Street, a uh, public member of Community Board 4, and I am now the interim co-chair of the newly formed West 36th Street Neighborhood Block Association. Uh, I'm here tonight on my behalf and behalf of the Block Association uh, to support item 12, which you'll be voting on later, which is a letter out of the HHHS committee addressing the hotel shelters in the West 30s. Simply, um, we need to reduce the number of the temporary shelters cited in the hotels on West 36th and 37th Street by relocating at least one or more of the shelters immediately. Uh, I think this is the fourth full board meeting I've been at speaking about this issue. Uh, there are too many shelters, too many shelter providers, all trying to operate in too close of proximity to one another. Uh, this is on top of West 36th and 37th Street's already existing social service providers such as Barber House and Fountain House, needle exchange programs, methadone clinics, and our neighborhood's already significant street homeless population, um, in large part due to our proximity to Penn and Port Authority. Earlier today, uh, I read that the city will be extending its contract with the Hotel Owners Association of New York for another six months. At this point, it's hard for us to see past the next six days or six hours on West 36th Street. We cannot continue like this. Uh, what we are experiencing is daily and relentless. There is so much more going on here on a constant basis uh, that, is, that is not even reported or documented. We just can't keep up with it. Uh, we jump ahead. Um, we are all legitimately fear for our safety and health every time we walk out the front door. We walk in the street in traffic to avoid conflict on our sidewalks, which if you are familiar with West 36th Street is really challenging. Thank you, Brian. Um, I really need more than two minutes, guys. Uh, as you noted, it's not your first time speaking on the topic. We're taking up uh, the topic this evening as well in the form of a letter. Um, and it's so uh, thank you for respecting the time limit, Brian. Um, next Brian, Brian, if, Brian, if you want to reach out to me afterwards, if there's something that we're not aware of, I'm happy to speak with you about it. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll forward my testimonial to you. Uh, put in writing. Thank you, Lowell. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Rowe is not here. Uh, Alan Mark is the next speaker, please. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can. The floor is yours. Two minutes. All right, uh, uh, thank you. I live... Um, in the West 30s. I am here just to uh, obtain support from everyone here because life in the West 30s is unattainable. The number of homeless shelters here has been a, such a safety issue for the children and the elderly and everyone that, that lives here. Drug use has become rampant. My next door neighbor was just assaulted yesterday. We're getting so little help from the mayoral office. The density of the shelters on West 36th is there's more shelter residents than there are actual residents. Um, my real my realtor uh, my uh, realtor won't even sell my apartment. Um, he he doesn't want me as a client anymore because he said it's impossible to sell anything because of the number of shelters here. I am asking all of you to please help us on West 36th Street to decrease the density of shelters. We have so many. Will everyone here please commit to helping us decrease the density of the shelters on 36th Street? Please. That's Thank you, I'm Mr. Right. Mark. You're welcome. Next speaker, Randy Barksdale, followed by Will Schwartz. Oh, can you hear me? There are those people in the attendee list. This is Mr. Barksdale, can you hear me? Oh, uh, you are here. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. Yes. Yes. I'm, on, I'm on West 36th Street for 22 years now, and it's, uh, it's, it's never been anything like this. Um, we've had good times and bad times, but this is really crazy because it's like running the uh, I'm sorry. 
I think we've lost you. Yeah, we lost him. I'm sorry about that. Hold on one second. Well, if we bring him back, we can. Yeah, um, let, let me get him back. Give me one second. Pause that time. And is our final speaker of the evening, Mr. Will Schwartz, uh, on the roster? No, he's not. Okay. Let me see if I can get our friend back. I do want to. Um, I know we had a um, 6:45 stop time. There is two people I want to acknowledge: one who had their hand up before that time, and another as well. Um, Alexander Mitelli and Lisa Wager, I'd like to add to the list. Randy, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, okay sorry yeah. about that. Your name, you're, you're calling through a different name, and so that's what was confusing. Okay. Um, no, I'm just saying that um, you, you really can't do anything on the street, um, and not, especially on, on the weekends. It's like ambulance after ambulance. You constantly hear people screaming, uh, yo, Kevin, yo, whoa. I mean, it's like all the time. So it's very hard to even think because I also work out of my apartment. Um, and it's just like nonstop, day in and day out. Can we please do something about the, the density? There's just too many people here. Um, you don't feel safe walking down the street. Uh, you have to walk through groups of guys that don't have masks on. They're all smoking cigarettes or, 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 or pot or drugs. Um, you can see them exchanging drugs constantly with money. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just crazy out here. And the uh, public officials are not responding to, 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 to anything. 15 seconds. Just, just please help and, and, and please do what you can to, to help us on 36th Street. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Alexander Mitelli, did we bring that person over? He's over. Great. Hi. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Two minutes starting now, please. Thank you very much. I, I, I will be brief. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here tonight. I, I'm also a resident of 36th Street. Uh, and the speakers who have uh, who have presented before me uh, have, have really have said it all. This is just to just to echo that sentiment and to kind of really hit home the uh, the situation that has just deteriorated so rapidly in such a small amount of time. My wife and I, my wife especially, long term uh, a long time resident of New York City. We are new to the 36th Street area, but we are not new to the city. Uh, we've lived in different parts of the city, in, including other boroughs, and it has just been a, a, a rapid deterioration with absolute little to no response from the city. The NYPD, more or less, I have seen them make arrests, and I've seen that person walk out three hours later because I live right near Midtown South. It is an unbelievable situation. Everyone here has said it. Brian Weber, I know, uh, has, has, been, uh, has been screaming at the top of his lungs. We really need as much help as we can get from as much of the community as we can possibly get to reduce the population of, of the homeless shelters. It is not it is because it is not just the, the residents of the shelters. It is the the activity that just unfortunately follows that that situation. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say that this is uh, that it's a, a homeless issue. This is more than that. It is a mental health issue. It is a drug issue. And the city has absolutely uh, closed, uh, turned their back, closed their eyes, closed their ears, are unwilling to help. And it is having a, such a dramatic effect. Seconds. It is having such a dramatic effect on, uh, uh, on the residents and the quality of life in the area. I appreciate the time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next invite I'll speaker, Lisa Wager. Lisa? Okay. Sorry. Hi. Are you with us? Go ahead. Thank Go ahead. you. Unmuted. Great article in the Daily News, Jeffrey. Thank Am I you. starting? Two minutes okay. is yours. Thanks. Um, so I'm Lisa Wager, Director of Government Community Relations at the Fashion Institute of Technology, SUNY College on 27th Street. And this month I'm going to talk about achievement, glitz, and pathways to higher ed. Uh, FIT alum Genesis Jerez, who graduated with a BFA in Fine Arts in 2016, began her term on October 1st as one of four artists in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem. 
This 11th month residency awards each artist a stipend of $20,000 and their work is exhibited at the museum during that time, although this year it's gonna be online at studiomuseum.org. Ms. Jerez's work re-examines her early childhood growing up in public housing in the Bronx in a traditional Dominican household. It's beautiful. I hope Jesse puts the link in the chat. Um, she participated in FIT's educational opportunity program and won four years of honors for her high GPA. The EOP is a state funded program that facilitates and supports access to higher ed for individuals from historically disadvantaged and underrepresented groups, providing expanded academic and personal support services while they're in college. And FIT's EOP program is the highest ranked of any in the SUNY system. Glitz. Dressing Queen Bey, Beyonce, the ultimate fashion icon, is a holy grail for designers and a sign of unparalleled validation. So, of course, on her recent movie yeah. visual item album, Black is King, Queen Bey wore many pieces designed by seven different FIT alumni, and maybe Jesse's putting that link in the chat. Um, Continuing Ed, our Center for Continuing and Professional Studies is offering pre-college programs for high school and middle school students and also adult credit and non-credit courses and certificate programs in the Creative Workforce for the Future, Business in the Areas of Creative Workforce for the Future, Business and Technology, Art and Design, Liberal Arts and Graduate Studies Exhibition and Experience Design. They're all taught by FIT faculty. Everything's conducted remotely this fall semester. Registration's still open. You can uh, look at the website, which I hope Jesse's putting in the chat. If you're interested or you know someone who might be, thank you for my Thank you, Lisa. Exercise. Record time, I think, actually. Yeah, well, I can't bagel you off to the side. You know? <laughs> well, uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I declare the public session closed. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you to all our speakers. I want to just say very quickly in response to the uh, people who spoke about 36th Street, the letter number 12 tonight that we'll be taking up is either the second or third letter that we have sent on this issue. And we recently joined a letter sent by Gail Brewer, Senator Robert Jackson, and Assemblymember Dick Gottfried um, that was sent to the Department of Homeless Services about this. So we are very well aware of your pain and we are working as diligently as we can to uh, find some sort of resolution. The second announcement I want to make is addressed to the board members. Um, can we please stop using the chat function for side conversations? It's there for the sharing of information only. Can we cut off the side conversations, please? Thank you. Um, from here, we're going to go to the report, uh, our local elected officials. Um, Senator Jackson has been waiting since the beginning of the meeting. So Senator Robert Jackson, if you are still with us, oh, I, the I'm floor here. is yours. I'm here for the entire meeting. So if anybody wants to go ahead of me. Uh, you, you, you're up first. Well, first, let me thank you for uh, coming in on your meeting. Um, and obviously, uh, <clears throat> my staff and I, we have met virtually by Zoom with residents of 36th Street. And we had a scheduled appointment with the commanding officer of Midtown South last week, but it was you know, we uh, rescheduled and it's scheduled for tomorrow to meet with the commanding officer and discuss with him the issues and concerns in order to, to bring about the type of resolutions where the residents uh, can feel that their safety and security uh, is uh, being considered. But right now they're at, in my opinion, based on everything that I heard tonight and the conversations that I've had with them, they're at wit's end on the, the fact that the concentration of so many uh, individuals uh, that need a home, whether they're in a shelter or not, and the issues and concerns that they're dealing with, uh, the drug abuse, the, you know, can't really uh, walk down the sidewalk to their home without uh, being, uh, walking into smoke clouds and or uh, comments being made by to the uh, women or the children of the <clears throat> residents there. Obviously, this is what they've expressed to me. I have not witnessed any of that stuff personally because I haven't been there, but I truly believe them. And I've always said, even if it was in, in my neighborhood up here in Washington Heights, the safety and security of our residents is number one. If I can't feel safe in my home and my neighborhood, we're in trouble. 
And so we, I, I am going to meet with the commanding officer of the Midtown South tomorrow, and I will let uh, the community board know what, if anything, has come out of that. So either Lowell or Jesse, I will be in contact with both of you about that. But the issue of the concerns have been expressed to all of us on a continuous basis. And what they're only hoping for is to have, it's a type of environment where um, they can walk in the streets going to their home and also feel safe and secure. Thank you. So, but let me get, that's about 36th Street. So I wanted to say that on, on all the other issues, let me tell you what's happened. We met with Chuck Schumer as far as on a Zoom call uh, two nights ago, when I say we, Broadway, uh, Manhattan Dems, uh, and also I had a discussion with our majority leader about what's happening with the budget, what's happening with um, uh, uh, mayor borrowing money from New York City, what's happening with the possibility of early re retirement incentives in order to reduce the headcount uh, without refilling them. Um, and it seems though everyone, both the governor and the state, uh, is hoping and waiting and praying uh, for the federal government to act. And all of you know uh, that the Democrats put forward a reduction of the $3 billion, $3 trillion package to $2.2 trillion, which was uh, you know, rejected by the Republicans. Uh, and uh, even Trump tweeted that he wanted them, both sides, to come together and come up with a package. I hope he really meant that. Some people don't believe he really meant that, but I surely hope so because the impact is devastating, uh, not only uh, in New York City, but around our country, and we know that. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, we're hoping and waiting that the federal government would act, uh, but you should know in the state legislature, uh, the budget director had, uh, he could have come down with a, a, a report of uh, the budget was not in, in uh, balance at end of April, uh, end of June, and now December, and nothing has been done. And as you know, all they had to do was tell us like the budget is two and a half billion dollars in the hole. And here are the proposed cuts that are going to be made. Uh, we, the state legislature, has 10 days, 10 days to either accept that or to reject it. And if we reject it, we have to then replace it with cuts. In essence, we have to determine where the cuts are going to take place. And that's just a bloodbath, in my opinion, that would occur. So everyone is waiting to see what happens at the feds. And obviously, uh, if they fail to act, if the Congress fails to act uh, before the election day, and I don't believe they will, uh, then we are hoping and praying that the Biden-Harris ticket wins in order to, uh, when he takes office, and he will deal with it, and hopefully he will. Uh, but the city of New York, uh, obviously, the, the mayor initially came in when we were up in Albany going back with the $7 billion budget budgeting situation that's now down to five. And some people said to me, they went to a, uh, a meeting with Liz Kruger and Liz Kruger said it's two, $2 billion. And I said, it may be $2 billion for the first year, uh, but the, the mayor is requesting $5 billion over three years. And unfortunately, uh, many people don't believe the mayor uh, as far as that he's telling the truth or they don't trust him or that he won't be there uh, in a year or two years when uh, other situations are there. In essence, he will be out of office as of December 31st, 2001, along with almost the entire city council. But uh, Scott Stringer, as you know, who's running for mayor, but Scott Stringer, the, uh, the state, the city controller, must agree on any borrowing uh, that the mayor puts forward. And as you may know, Corey Johnson had indicated over a month ago that, uh, that a resolution will come forward from the city council basically approving or uh, going along with the borrowing. And the mayor, as you know, had basically said to the unions who were supposed to have layoffs around October 4th uh, that he's putting off on that with understanding that the money that we receive from borrowing would be able to uh, forego the layoffs. Uh, so. Uh, from a budgetary point of view, at the state level, that's where we are waiting for the feds. No one wants to act first. And I can't blame them, quite frankly, because it's devastation. 
there will be thousands and thousands and thousands of layoffs, not only in New York City, but around the state. And in fact, Rochester has already laid off teachers. Yonkers has already laid off teachers as a result of 20% of all education budgets have been put on hold. And money that uh, state legislatures have, uh, legislators have allocated to CBOs and uh, other organizations, uh, there's a hole on that. So they're not even approving those. Everything's on hold as far as funding for organizations that we've allocated money to. So we're, that's the jam that we're in, quite frankly. And as I said, the most important thing is we have to have enough to sustain the people of our city and state while we deal with this whole pandemic and the result of that. And so uh, that's where we are. We ask everybody, please, please wear masks, please social distancing, please wash your hands, don't stand too close to people. Because if not, then we all who don't follow that, it's gonna make the situation worse uh, for not only our city, but our state and our country. Thank uh, you so much, Senator. The, the yeah. legislation, um, you should, all should have received my newsletter that came out no more than about three or four days ago, which has legislation that we passed, legislation that we're hoping to, to deal with when we come back on housing, so forth and so on. Thank you so much, Senator. We appreciate yeah. your time. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna stay in the with the state legislature now. I'm gonna go to assembly member Richard Godfried. Well, good evening. Uh, good to be here with all of you. Um, let me talk quickly about a couple of things. One, uh, uh, you know, Lowell mentioned earlier the uh, the situation with uh, homeless in in Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen. Uh, you know, in in our community, we have uh, we have welcomed an awful lot of programs uh, for homeless people and people with a variety of uh, needy conditions. Uh, what we always find is that what is needed is a strong program of services and uh, and security, and the, where we get that in place from the provider, from the city, uh, things tend to work out a whole lot better. Uh, I think I don't think we have seen that uh, in the community uh, uh, from the homeless in the hotels uh, and and the providers that are supposed to be on the job. Uh, and I think we need to make sure uh, that the providers in the hotels and the city are, are providing the services and security uh, that we need. Um, one quick thing about the election, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try to avoid uh, expressing partisan opinions, but you know, we've, we've all focused a lot on voting uh, by absentee ballot. And that's an important thing to do. But my message is that if you are at all able to vote in person, uh, whether it's through at an early voting site where presumably the, uh, the crowds uh, will be a lot less and social distancing will be a lot easier, if you can vote in person by early voting, uh, or on election day. That's enormously important because the absentee ballots are going to get counted, but they're not going to be showing up in the count uh, until a week or two or more uh, after election day. It's going to be very important to the security of our country and to the security of, our, of the election uh, that the votes of Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen show up on TV on election night uh, in the national totals. Because if the national total uh, is not the right way, I think we will see massive disruption of uh, the counting of ballots uh, to follow. So having a strong vote from Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen, I won't talk about how you ought to vote, uh, having that show up in the national totals on election night is gonna be really important. Last thing I wanna talk about is taxes. Uh, there's no way we're gonna get enough help from Washington. I don't know if we'll get any help from Washington. No way that we're gonna get enough to dig us out of the coronavirus hole 
or to dig us out of the, the austerity budget hole that we've been digging deeper and deeper into even before the coronavirus uh, uh, evolved. In order to do that, New York needs to enact a strong package of increased taxes on ultra high wealth. Uh, I don't think anybody listening tonight is, 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 is likely to be in the group that we're talking about taxing. Uh, but unless we increase the taxes on really ultra high wealth, we're not going to be able to fund healthcare and education and housing and transportation and a host of other needs. Uh, and I've been working with uh, all of our local elected uh, legislators and those from around the state uh, to press the legislative leadership and the governor uh, to do that. Uh, we've been fighting to get that done for months now. Uh, it's really got to happen. That's my message for tonight. Thank you so much, Dick. I again want to thank Senator Jackson, Assemblymember Godfrey and Borough President Brewer for uh, joining that letter on 36th Street that, that we joined. Um, so thank you all again. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stay with the state. Assemblymember Linda Rosenthal is here with us tonight. Linda, it's all yours. Great. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all before the uh, events later on tonight. Um, so I, I had carried a bill about the pink tax, which is um, the practice of charging pink products or products targeted for women um, more than the same products that are targeted at men, which has been a longstanding uh, practice. And so it was included in the budget and, and now gender-based discrimination in products and services will no longer be allowed. So the pink razor should cost as much as the blue one and uh, the dry cleaning should also cost the same amount. So um, it went into effect uh, the other day. So I'm happy about that. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the ruling on mechanical voids. Uh, many of you know uh, mechanical voids are those empty spaces that developers have begun inserting in the middle and lower levels of buildings um, so that they can increase the height because mechanical spaces are not counted toward the total FAR. Um, a judge named Arthur and Gorin, who may, maybe many of you know, ruled in beautiful language that this is done simply to circumvent the zoning laws. And he said it was illegal. And he also said, gave, made them All right, I thought I froze, but it appears that Assembly Member Rosenthal froze. Am I right about that? Can everyone else hear me? She's in one of the voids. Uh, yeah, I think Linda just got lost in one of the building voids. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's on her side of things. I can't get. I can't get her back. Yeah. All right. Well, then let's move on, and I can, we can come back. We can circle back to Linda. I want to go to the Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer next. And if Linda comes back, she should just continue. But um, yep. I want. I also want to just say on this letter. I understand that we wrote the letter. Thank you for everybody who signed on, including Community Board Four. And I understand Commissioner Banks has said that he is going to set up a time with. Uh, DHS to discuss all these issues, but let's make sure it happens soon. I will stay on it. And I want to thank Speaker Johnson's office because I know we've been working with the Skyline also, et cetera. So the whole issue of homeless. Um, NYCHA working group to the credit of the city uh, every Tuesday night before pandemic, we met at um, usually at the one of the Fulton or uh, Chelsea Elliott to discuss what is going to happen with those buildings in terms of RAD. So those meetings are continuing now. They will be virtual, um, but it is helpful for me because it sets the tone hopefully for other RADs and we have many, many of them in the borough of Manhattan. Um, you probably know that there are some no, new commanding officers. So I went to the, I think the 10th and the 13th and the 17th were the only precincts last Tuesday, uh, last night, where there was outdoor activity. Now activity was quite limited except for the 10th. And I wanna thank 
uh, both Chelsea Elliott and Fulton because they had members, residents, and PD there to talk about issues of concern. So the 10th precinct is always wonderful and the new uh, commanding officer Gold is fantastic. You should know that uh, regarding the Hudson River Park, you gotta go see Pier 26. It is phenomenal. It's quite a story that goes with it. It's brand new, but um, we have an appointment, as you know, three total. Uh, I had put uh, my friend Douglas Durst, but he decided to resign uh, representing board four because he is one of yours. And I'm really honored that Lowell Kern has agreed to be the Hudson River Park trust representative from the community board for area. So thank you very much, Well, I know you'll be a great uh, addition. And you should know that when I went to the opening of the pier, they're all very excited um, that you're going to be the representative because they know you care about the park and you care about the community. And that's can't get a higher uh, recommendation than that. Even from people who are complaining about everything, they're very excited. Um, we're always focused, as you know, on the 8th Avenue link stations. It's a very long story, but um, much thanks to you and Brian Lewis from our office. We've been meeting with Do It, and they are willing to talk to us about uh, some of the challenges of putting in or disabling the particular stations that are problematic for all the reasons that you know. So I just want to say thank you, and it's ongoing. Um, we also, uh, you know, we put out a list of all the places that are public to go to the bathroom. There are 100 public restrooms in the borough of Manhattan. I'm not saying they're all in great shape. But I will say that this is not just a problem for those who are homeless. It's a problem for just everyday New Yorkers. Um, and it's a problem because almost every bathroom, understandably, of uh, what was available is now closed due to the uh, virus. So it, it's, uh, you may not, I have um, many of, uh, you know, individuals who have brought this to my attention and it is a huge issue. Nick talked about the elections. I, I just want to say about the census, we know we have more time. What we've been doing in board four is two things. One is, I think I might've mentioned, we still have that 35,000 person listing from the June primary of those who moved out temporarily. And we mailed to them with the League of Women Voters. There's some good news. People have been calling from Connecticut, Long Island, upstate. Am I supposed to fill it out again? Yes, you are. We took out ads in Connecticut, upstate and Long Island, big, huge ads saying the same thing, fill out with your Manhattan address. At the same time, working with um, 32BJ and Redney, we've been working with probably 150 large buildings. For some reason, they didn't get focused on, even though uh, enumerators went, they couldn't get in. We can't do the self-reporting because people aren't there or they didn't do it, they can't get in. But I can tell you the management is being very helpful. They can at least tell us that in apartment 6 two, for instance, there are five people who live there. You can't do the self-reporting, which is the really best number, but at least this, you know, 8%, which is what's uh, at stake with these larger buildings, will be able to tell us something about the demographics. And that is what we're doing with those large buildings. The school is ongoing. The biggest problem, somewhat in District 2, but definitely in the other districts, is the issue of devices. Um, in some districts, it's 600, it's 500 kids who just do not have a device. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into all the specifics. We're putting it in a letter. We've been in touch. We have money from 2020 that was in our budget that we just got permission to spend. Don't get me started on that topic. Uh, but it's going to take eight weeks. So if I'm a principal and I say I need 200 devices, it's going to take eight weeks. So that's almost the entire semester, given where we're at. At the same time, the city says we have the devices. Well, where are the devices? So ongoing. Um, also, we're always pushing, as you can imagine, about social workers. But the first day of school, we had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. We covered almost all the schools in Manhattan giving out packets nicely put together by wonderful, wonderful interns with sanitizer, masks, and of course, census information. What a challenging time. I also want to thank uh, Community Board 4 because with the speaker's office and with the board, you've been doing cleanup, cleanup, cleanups, and it really makes a difference. I think if there's a silver lining and there isn't for the pandemic, and it's not good that the sanitation department got a 65% cut for weekday service, and of course, the uh, weekend cut of 100% or maybe a little bit less with some restoration. But the volunteerism 
from one part of the borough to the other um, has been phenomenal. I know that the, the jail is not in your area, but it is of interest, I think, to everybody. If we end up with a jail, there's a lawsuit, we may not end up with a jail um, where the detention center is now in Community Board 1. But just so you know, according to the lawsuit that community folks want to stop it, we as a community cannot put a shovel in the ground. But ongoing can be discussions with stakeholders and then and, uh, on the next one is October 14th at 6.30, it's all virtual. And if you're interested, uh, let us know. I'm also, just finally, I'm a big supporter of the shed. Um, it's, you know, it's controversial. Everything in Hudson Yards is controversial, but I do think they have a really good uh, focus on uh, diversity in art and so on and so forth. So they're opening on the 16th of October and it's free um, for at least the first few uh, days. And if you have time to reserve, you might find it really fabulous. Um, the Borough President's Office has been working with the City Commission on Human Rights in anti-bias trainings on all different topics, and we're going to set up a whole bunch more uh, during the month of November. Uh, you know that Deputy Borough President Alden Bonilla is leaving to go to a foundation. He will be a great asset there, but we will certainly miss him, and I know you will also. Thank you, Community Board 4, and congratulations on everything that you're doing. Thank you, Borough President Brewer. Uh, Linda Rosenthal seems to have solved her computer problems and rejoined us. So Linda, right. we'll let you finish up. All right, you know, I'm really such a tech expert. <laughs> I just logged out and logged back in. That's always the first answer. Anyway, so I was talking about the mechanical voids. I'm not sure where I froze, but those are spaces within buildings in the mid and lower parts of buildings that developers have been leaving mostly empty they put the, you know, the HVAC and other mechanicals in there, but then most of it goes empty. But what it does is increases the height because those spaces are not counted toward the FAR. And so Justice Arthur and Gorin ruled that that was illegal. And he also stopped the, um, he put a stop on the construction. Uh, Senator Jackson and I have a bill that would outlaw these kinds of tricks because every developer has to out tall the next one. So um, it's all circumvents zoning and what's the point of zoning if developers are gonna find a way around it. So we're, we're working on that for um, next session. And I think uh, there's, when developers go back to building, they'll be back to their same old tricks and uh, it's not the right way to go. I know you guys have been talking about the DeWitt dog run. Uh, we spoke to Parks um, about it. And I know that the CB4 Waterfront um, Parks and Environmental Committee is writing a letter. We wrote a letter as well, supporting your letter and the efforts of the of um, Jenny Lee. Uh, if you have a dog run, it might as well be used. Otherwise, what's the point? So hopefully they will find the funding to, to fix the parts and I've offered to help out with that. Uh, this weekend I was uh, helped clean West 51st Street. Um, a gross job so hats off to the sanitation men and women um, but you know I guess these times call for a thousand points of light um, but I do think that some sanitation money needs to be put back because it's not just unsightly it's it attracts the vermin and uh, it's just generally a bad idea I'm having a flu shot day on October 20th for those of you who need flu shots or they're not the senior high dose, those are in short supply. But if you or anyone you know of who needs a flu shot, they should um, email or call my office. It's October 20th uh, from 10 to three at Lincoln Square Neighborhood Center at 65th Street. And it'll be all done outdoors under tents with Mount Sinai and uh, Goddard Riverside Lincoln Square Neighborhood Center. And the last item is, uh, the aforementioned vermin, we're having a rat academy um, on November 17th with uh, various uh, block associations, um, et cetera. So if you're interested, uh, also call my office. And uh, that's it. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I, I'm going to go next to Congressman Nadler, but I want to just I, I just have to say this because it's getting a little ridiculous. I've gotten six texts in the last 10 minutes reminding me there's a debate tonight. 
that some people may want to watch. Um, so I'm going to ask everyone who speaks, whether it's the rest of the electeds or Jesse when he does the district manager's report or any of the other board business we do, if we could keep this as tight as possible, because evidently there, there's a lot of people who want to watch TV tonight. So with that, Congressman Nadler, I'm sure you've got something to say about the debate. Yes, indeed. I'm, I'm happy to be with you all this evening, the, the night of the debate. And I want to start by saying I hope everyone is continuing to remain safe and healthy and taking precautions to keep themselves that way. As you may know, the House last week passed an updated HEROES Act, which was a modified bill from the legislation we passed back in May. The legislation once again provides economic relief for American families by providing stimulus checks, restoring and expanding the weekly $600 federal unemployment payments through next January, bolstering housing assistance through direct rent relief, increasing food stamp benefits by 15%. It supports small businesses by improving the Paycheck Protection Program, providing the hardest hit small businesses, nonprofits and entrepreneurs with second loans, provides state and local governments with the funding they need to help weather this crisis. New York State itself will receive $21 billion in New York City, about $9 billion. It provides essential support for transit infrastructure, contains substantial assistance for the MTA, which will allow the MTA to continue operations into next year. It fully funds the Postal Service and provides states with new resources to safeguard the integrity and security of our elections and ensuring the integrity of the 2020 census. I'm very proud that this package contains two pieces of legislation that I sponsored, the Restaurants Act and the Save Our Stages Act. New York City will provide, uh, will provide to New York City additional targeted assistance for independent restaurants and live entertainment venues and theaters, many of which have been devastated by the economic impacts of the pandemic. We will keep fighting to ensure that Americans and our institutions get the relief and resources they need during this trying time. I'm also pleased to announce that the House Judiciary Committee's Antitrust Subcommittee released the findings of its more than 16 month long investigation into the state of competition in the digital economy, especially amongst dominating companies like Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, our investigation demonstrates the need for Congress to take action in restoring competition, preventing these companies from further exploiting their power. It, it shows the necessity of amending the antitrust laws uh, in order to regulate monopoly and uh, have effective antitrust. Uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, so I'll leave it there. And please do not hesitate to reach out to my staff if we can be of any assistance. Thank you so much, Congressman Nadler. Um, I think that's the last of the electeds who are here. I'm going to go next to Carl Wilson from Speaker Corey Johnson's office. Thank you, Lowell. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, just get right to it. Um, a large bulk of our uh, time in CB4 this past month has been meeting with uh, several of the uh, shelter providers that are in our district. We've been working very closely with our partners in government, which include the other local elected officials in CB4. And we've had a series of meetings with, shelter, with the shelter providers and DHS for uh, the ones in our district. We recently met with uh, 36th Street to just uh, operators on 36th Street to uh, discuss their operations and some of the complaints we've seen. We understand that each of the shelters there are adding two full-time security members who focus exclusively on the outside of the shelter. Um, and we expect them to start soon before the end of the month. Uh, one of the problems we also identified there was the lack of programming space that is inside uh, the small budget hotels. So we've been in touch with Metro Baptist Church uh, to find some programming space for both NICA and BVSJ, who are the providers there. Um, it's looking promising and we are scheduled to walk through for next week. Um, we've also been in touch with some of the general contractors about scaffolding work, uh, uh, work on those uh, uh, our neighboring buildings that have a lot of scaffolding erected, specifically at 315 and 327. Uh, both contractors told us that they are nearing the uh, completion of that work and expect to have it down by the end of the month. And we've offered assistance with DOB in clearing any of their final sign-off hurdles. And then uh, finally on 36th Street, we have also instructed ACE, which is a supplemental cleaning service that we provide funding for, to uh, service that block four days a week, which they do from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, the Skyline Hotel is another um, spot that's had some problems um, up in Hell's Kitchen. We've had a series of meetings with their director in DHS with uh, each of the school principals, as well as some of the local business owners to establish some clear lines of communication. They have a large interior space, which they have begun using, and we've been helping to identify some volunteers that want to help uh, assist with some of that programming. 
Um, and there's also uh, recently a stationed security guard out front five days a week, and they're looking to fill uh, a slot for an additional, uh, to bring someone on to cover the additional two. Uh, we've heard some things are improving there from um, constituents in the area and, and the local block association that I attended last night. But, you know, it's one of those things we have to remain vigilant about. And we want to stay in touch with everyone um, on, on this issue. And then finally, a site on 45th Street, uh, we met with residents uh, in the block association and we were able to help set up some additional security patrols and sanitation services there. And that uh, was how we were not really running into any problems from that block association either. Um, as Gail mentioned, in September, we had a community cleanup day uh, in partnership with our block associations in Community Board 4 and across District 3. And um, also, if you've been down 9th Avenue recently, you may have noticed some of our new trash cans. Uh, we purchased several new, uh, new the silver cans to uh, replace the wire baskets on each corner along 9th Avenue between 42nd and 57th Street. Um, and uh, that is really um, it for me uh, on some of the main points from the past month. Thanks so much, Carl. Um, Luke Wolf from Controller Scott Stringer's office, last but not least. Hi everyone, uh, Luke Wolf from City Controller Stringer's office. I'll try to keep my remarks brief as well. Just wanna to touch upon one, some of the work we're doing on small business and then also some of our back to school efforts um, on small businesses. We know businesses are struggling right now. One estimate for that one out of every three might be gone after the pandemic, which is why we launched our Save Main Street initiative um, to help New York City small businesses. It has three parts, it has uh, 25 total points to the plan, but I'll just run some of the main ones. The first point is about struggling uh, businesses right now. So for that, we wanna provide tax credits for independent businesses to help cover the cost of reopening. Uh, the idea is to create a New York City tech core to help small businesses adopt digital tools and develop an online presence. And another idea is providing legal assistance to businesses that are right now involved in rent disputes. Um, the second plank is about supporting new businesses and entrepreneurship. So creating a single point of contact if you want to launch a new business and waiving some of those initial business fees uh, over the next 10 months. Similarly, we want to create a re-entrepreneurship program. So if you are a business owner who wants to get rid of your business, have a marketplace where a new entrepreneur would be able to take that over. So we're recycling the business and space in the neighborhood. The third plank is about building stronger neighborhoods to support those businesses. So continuing to think about how we can repurpose our street space so it's the best for community and businesses uh, and uh, think about that moving forward. And also how can we make sure that if there are vacant spaces, don't let them stay vacant so you can have an entire vibrant uh, street skit for the community. So I'll drop that plan in the chat and feel free to look through all 25 points um, whenever you have some time. Back to school is also uh, top of mind right now. So some of our work around that is we put together a back to school guide, which I will share. It's available in Chinese, English, and Spanish. And has a lot of great information for parents and school communities uh, as part of the back to school work that uh, we know has been so challenging for so many people. Uh, we also called in the city to make public schools more inclusive for non-binary and gender non-conforming students. So right now they do not have the option to self-identify uh, as they would like on the city's online platforms. So we think they should be able to, to express themselves through the city's online platforms in that way. Um, just to kind of end on a positive note, uh, we were able to return over $2 million in stolen uh, prevailing wages over the course of the pandemic. Uh, two workers across the city. We know that every dollar counts, especially now. Uh, so we will continue to do that work, but we're really proud of our, our efforts to donate the two, to get back the $2 million so far and make sure that ends up in families' pockets across the city. Thanks so much, Luke. Um, next up on the agenda, I'm going to go to our district manager, Jesse Bodine, who tells me he has a 30 page PowerPoint to go through right now. Move to veto. Um. <laughs> second, second. Uh, um, I'll be very quick, everybody. Uh, so, um, uh, so just uh, starting off with, um, I just wanted to highlight one of the email blasts that we've been doing on sort of on a, on a recent regular basis, which is sort of a uh, kind of a, a, a complete kind of robust uh, email about uh, homeless services and, and what's happening out in the district, specifically about street homeless. Uh, something that I have asked and have gotten in the past on a regular basis from the uh, homeless outreach is uh, a monthly report. Um, and so uh, with the help of the speaker's office who have been holding uh, more uh, uh, meetings twice a month, uh, we've been getting these reports twice a month. And so we've been sending those out along with a toolkit and an additional uh, uh, fly, you know, flyers of information. And I just want to highlight that because it really does give a great report back 
to the community what the outreach programs are doing, how many times they're interacting with people, the hot spots that they know of, the encampments they clean up, the folks, the number of folks that they house and get off the street. And so I think it's a really good understanding of what's going out, going on every day and all of the hard work. It also provides flyers for the public to be able to provide folks out on the street, you know, uh, flyers to uh, uh, health clinics and things like that. Um, all sorts of stuff. Also, uh, the speaker's donations uh, has, is running a donation drive. So things like that for folks from the community to help and feel that they can engage and do something helpful and useful. We also include our toolkit, which we've always had on our website, which lists the services in our area and what you can do to help and, and uh, to provide assistance. Um, so I just want to highlight that. I also then just wanted to um, remind everybody that they really need, oh, this is specifically just for full board members, uh, you really need to fill out your voting sheets uh, at the end of the night. Um, uh, and at the, you have to really do it immediately after your, um, your roll call vote. Um, we've been running into issues lately in which we don't, we have to chase folks down for their vote sheets. People want to correct them afterwards or something like that. And that's just not allowed. It's just like in, if we were holding our in-person meeting and I'm screaming at the end of the meeting to hand in your vote sheets. So you really have to do get it in. You have to have to get it in tonight. Um, uh, uh, as the meeting goes. And then I do want to end on a positive note. Um, uh, with Due to the generosity of Brookfield Properties and a great assistance from uh, CB4 member Josephine Ishman, uh, the CB4 district office was able to help deliver $5,000 to the PTAs of PS33 and PS51 for their reopening needs. And so uh, that was a good, you know, it was really helpful. Principals have got a lot on their shoulders to try to figure out, and some of these and some of the schools don't as have some schools have very uh, well endowed PTAs and some don't. So this is a real help, and Josephine was very helpful in help uh, getting that uh, to the money to the right people and things like that. Um, that's really it. I will just say uh, so Monday the office is closed due to October twelfth, uh, and therefore uh, the Aces committee has been pushed to actually reschedule to Tuesday October twentieth. Um, budget task force will be meeting on Thursday, October 22nd. And for now, right now, the CB4 nominating committee is tentatively scheduled for Monday, October 26th. Um, all other committees meet at the regular time. Thank you, Jesse. Speaking of the nominating committee, Paul Devlin is going to give us a report from said committee. Great. Um, Jesse, do you mind sharing screen for my PowerPoint presentation, if that's possible? Just kidding, everybody. Um, the function October, is broken somehow. <laughs> um, this is the month that we um, bring in all our suggestions. As Jesse pointed out, we'll have our nominating committee meeting later in the month to do interviews. Um, at the November meeting, we'll report out all of the nominations. Um, December is when we'll vote on the officers. As of this point, all the sitting officers have all agreed to run for re-election. Um, we may have some other candidates for some of the seats which would be you know, a little bit more fun to have an election that people actually have to vote in, um, but we'll have a full report at our November meeting for our December vote. Thank you, remember to vote. Thank you, Paul. I'm gonna to go to uh, Jessica Chait next. She is the, our second vice chair and the chair of the budget task force. And she wants to talk about the budget task force or whether she wants to or not, I want her to, so. <laughs> Thank you, Lowell. Um, <clears throat> as um, we shared at the last meeting, we're in this process right now where we really gather feedback, um, not only from our committees, but also really from the community about um, what our priorities should be in terms of advocating for the budget. Keep in mind, this is next year's, this is 2022 budget. Um, so I encourage everyone to show up to their committees um, in these next, uh, these next few weeks and to really go through that process, look at what we put together previously, as well as think of new topics um, that may be, uh, have, have come to light as a result of COVID and what it has uh, brought to our city. And, and then sim in addition to that, we've also created a very brief survey, it's super easy. We've already had 120 requests, which is, or excuse me, uh, respondents, which I think is great. Um, but I really wanna encourage all of you here um, to circulate that and really let's try to use this opportunity to get as much feedback from the community uh, so that we can put together a request that really reflects the unique needs of our district. And I'm assuming we can drop the link in the chat if you didn't see the email. 
Yeah, yeah Jessica. Jessica. Now, Jessica, and it's also on our website on our homepage. Great, and I'll just say one other thing, which is we'd like respondents uh, responses, excuse me, by the 16th. But since you're all here right now, it's super fast. You can do it um, or send it out to people to do it as soon as possible. Thank you, Jessica. Um, for the rest of the chair's report, um, we continue to meet with DHS and others regarding the 36th Street situation, which I'm sure comes as no surprise to anyone. We have attended uh, this. Carl referenced the speaker's office calls regarding Skyline Hotel. We've continued to we've attended those meetings. We have continued to attend the biweekly CBO meetings about harm reduction and the street harm homeless initiative to try and deal with that issue, um, which has been exacerbated by COVID. The NYCHA working group has continued to has restarted meeting and it continues to meet. Um, and otherwise, it's been business as usual, trying to get things done around here. Um, the one thing I need to point out personally, as the borough president mentioned, um, she appointed me to serve on the board of directors of the Hudson River Park Trust to be the CB4 rep to the board of directors of the trust, which means that anything coming up before this board about the Hudson River Park Trust's going forward, I will have to recuse myself and um, we'll figure out how to, how to do that since Jeffrey is the chair of the committee. I'm not sure he's going to take over that or whether Jessica will, um, but I will be recusing myself from any HRPT matters going forward. Um, and I think that's, hang on, I got a, I got a note here. Um, I think it would be good to mention that Midtown North was kind enough to notify us of a recent street closure. Yes, um, in response to what we've talked about, thank you, Dale, um, and, and there was sensitivity to street closures. Um, Midtown North closed 54th Street for a day or so and then um, notified us again when they reopened it. So um, they've heard our request to keep us in the loop on that. So thank you to uh, Midtown North. And with that, I think we are done with the chair's report. So we're going to move on to the business session. And I'm going to start with the business licensing and permits committee. So Frank and Bert, take it away. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm not sure what's going on with my Zoom. Um, is that a yes? We yes, we can, yes we can hear you, Bert. Go okay. ahead. Okay. So we have four items to vote on plus a fifth for ratification at um, exec. Um, I'd like to bundle them all. Okay, are there any questions or any of the BLP items? Motion right. to adopt. Well, we're gonna, do, we're gonna do it in one single vote, I think, right. like we've been doing. So as long as there are no questions, we'll move on. Um, hearing Easy. none. We'll go to the Waterfront Parks and Environment, Jeffrey and Marty. Can I have just one, one question, uh, Laura? Um, yes, Leslie, question. go ahead. On the item, which is boxers, can that be pulled out separately? Well, it, it, if you want what we've been doing, if, if you want to vote against that letter for whatever reason, assuming that's the case, when we get to you on the roll call, you can say no on four and, um, you know, and, and yes on the rest. We didn't get any comments from the public on that. Um, so I don't think we need to have a separate roll call on that. Uh, okay. That was exactly my thinking, Lowell, that since if there had been public comments on boxers or any of the other items, I would have pulled it out. But since there was no one here to speak, I said, okay, let's bundle. Yep. Les, you'll still have your ability to vote against the letter if that's what you're intending to do. Um, but I don't think we need a separate roll call on it. Great, thank you. Jeffrey and Marty, WPA. Two letters, I think fairly straightforward. Marty, I'm not sure if you're here. Um, intend to bundle them unless there's questions. Are there any questions on item six and seven? The um, cruise ship terminal and the DeWitt Clinton dog run. There have been some edits on the cruise ship term, terminal, but they are not uh, significant, but it, it's a better letter from the input that we've had. It says the same thing. Hearing no questions, we'll move on to transportation. Christine and Dale. 
Yes, I'd like to uh, bundle the three items. Are there any questions on items eight, nine, or 10? There is a small change in uh, the um, letter nine, but it's not, you know, it doesn't change the, it's a small style change. We just have one question. Go ahead, Bert. On uh, item 10, the concluding sentence, um, I mean, it sounds really good. Uh, fiscal crisis presents opportunity to allocate resources from Department of Transportation and Sanitation for a greater public good. It sounds really lovely. Do you have any specifics behind that? Or was it just like an exploration? Well, we didn't, we, we have specifics, but we didn't want to advance the specifics until we had much more discussion in the community, in the transportation committee. So we left it pretty open and general. Will you be coming back then in the future yes. with some more specific? Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks, Christine. Okay. Okay. So no further questions on the transportation matters. Um, Jesse, what did you just ask me? Um, right, okay, the, the NYPD pedestrian access letter, um, we've gotten a request, Christine, that, that it be addressed to all of the commanding officers of the various precincts since they're all new. Uh, okay, um, and, and copy to Commissioner Shea then? Um, well, the request was to include them. Um, so maybe address it to them in CC, Shay. Okay. We can do that. In the past, it has not been uh, successful at all. Well, they're all new, so maybe it's worth a shot. At least that was the request, if you're okay with that. Okay, we can do that. Okay, thank you. Um, no other questions? Chelsea Land Use, Paul and Betty. Um, I'm going to take this one. We have a letter, one letter on a um, historic, historic building on West 23rd Street. They had previously asked for fire bricks. Uh, they're now asking for all wood. They had previously asked for arched windows, not to, they had previously asked for squared windows. We had asked them to do arched windows. LPC agreed with us last year. So we just restated our position that we want all wood and an arched top window. Um, so that's pretty straightforward and clear. Any questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to the Housing, Health, Human Services Committee. This is the letter on the health hotel shelters in the West 30s, Maria and Joe. So I'll just sort of set the stage, then Maria will take over the, the letter and I'll take the questions at the end. We um, have put together a very comprehensive letter about all the shelters and the issues of the very poor management by the administration of dumping the shelters without proper thought. We really laid out the context of our community uh, facilities we have for homeless and supportive housing and ask in essence that there be a sit down and a plan developed to basically correct a bad decision to have so many people with so many social service issues located in one area and it is we have gotten a lot of response back from committee members a lot of changes happened to the letter a lot of tweaking so that's pretty much about it I turn it over to Maria um, so exactly what Joe said thank you Joe um, I too was reminded about the debates this evening, so I have some notes, and I'm going to even make them. I'm going to make them just a little shorter. Um, if anyone hasn't read the letter, Maria, Lowell, did you say something? We're not pressed. We're not as pressed for time as I thought we were going to be. So make sure you can make your points because this is an important letter. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. So it is an important letter, and I was going to suggest if you have not read the letter, I would urge you to re take some time to read the letter, even if you just go over it briefly. Um, the, the letter itself is 11 pages, and that's excluding the attachments. Um, and basically, uh, I'll just give you a quick rundown of the letter. Um, we open the letter that as a result of the density on 36th and 37th below 42nd Street is now a public safety crisis. Although basically, you know, we all know because of COVID emergency relocations from congregate kinds of settings into hotels was necessary, but on 36th and 37th Street, there are 812 beds. And basically we're saying that it's, it was a poor policy, 
policy decision and we're requesting four things. Reducing the density on 36. We're asking uh, DHS to hold uh, the nonprofit providers accountable. Number three is dedicated street outreach. Number four is coordination between DHS street outreach and NYPD public safety enforcement. Uh, we talk a little bit about the background of CB4 in terms of uh, the number of homeless shelters and other facilities that um, house people who are uh, temporarily house people. Um, we have a table, so that's a table in itself in the letter, as well as the number of supportive housing we have uh, in the community. That's in a table in the letter. And in the letter as well is a table of the reduction density sites. DHS calls them reduction density sites. Um, and the numbers all together of all the beds is over a little bit over 4,000 in CB4 and may, much of that is in Hell's Kitchen. Uh, further in the letter, we have, we talk about, we have a table for the number of attendees at the committee meeting that we had uh, from June through se to September. Those two months alone, it more than doubled. Um, so that tells you that's significant. Um, we also discuss in the letter the, the, we give examples of what uh, residents on 36th Street, permanent residents on 36th Street say they have experienced. Uh, we highlight that this is not NIMBYism. This is a common sense request for a reduction. And I, I, I want to make that really clear for everyone, uh, that it's not NIMBYism. We're asking for common sense requests, okay? And I, I want to also highlight right here, and I don't know if we highlight in the letter. If we did not, Joe, we need to also put in the letter that um, some of our electeds, Gail, Dick Gottfried, and Robert Jackson also wrote a letter specifically about 36th Street. Um, that, what else is significant for you to know in the letter? Even with the moves from out of the district, and I mean, we had two congregate kinds of care settings in the district and the WJ being relocated still on 36th and 37th Street, we have over 40% of the density right there. And on 36th Street alone, it's 518 beds. I think that's worth knowing. So basically we're saying in our letter, this is beyond a quality of life issue. This is a public safety issue. We try to also highlight the very real likelihood that as a result of this poor planning decision, that there may be resistance to future potential social service programs in the community. We have an Appendix A, B and C, and we're going to be attaching uh, in Appendix C, it's going to be a map of all the locations in the district. Um, Appendix A is just the questions by the committee and the public. Appendix B is the main comments by each public member who spoke, and I, I need to fix that. Um, and we're attaching our letters from June and August, which were about this issue, specifically about the density that was on 51st Street and but all three letters are including 36th Street. Um, the other thing I just want to add is thank you to everyone who provided feedback so far. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Maria, I would suggest adding Gail's letter as an attachment as well. Okay. Which Good we idea. signed thank on you. to. Um, I just want to jump in here because I've been working with Maria and Joe on this. Um, on the NIMBY point, because that seems to be a concern of a lot of people. Just for perspective, um, I think you're all probably aware of the brouhaha that erupted on the Upper West Side. That was about three hotels in a 10 block radius. There is chaos going down on now in CB1 about a single hotel that's being moved. We're talking about three hotels in a one square block area on 36th Street. Um, and we have offered repeatedly to work with DHS to relocate this hotel within our district. We are not looking to ship this out and say we don't want to deal with the homeless. We are more than happy to work with DHS to do that. It's just it's too much for this block in this neighborhood. And that's what the letter emphasizes. Um, if anyone has any questions, Joe will answer them. Um, any questions? Christine, I saw your hand first. No, I just had a comment. It's, it's a fantastic letter and a lot of work there and so on. Uh, but I, I would rec 
recommend if we, if we could move up the ask to the first, the very first. Christine time. already anticipated it, and I was about Thank to offer that. Thank <laughs> you. And then I mentioned that to Maria is that even though we all know it's not NIMBY and and we know the history. I would also put some sentence about that at the beginning, because mm -hmm. if people don't read the, less, the rest of the letter, you know, I'm sure you put it there, but some people are going to read, you know, the first two paragraphs and that's it. So I would just put it there. That's a friendly suggestion. Um, excuse me, I, I have a question actually about the letter. Um, I'm wondering if we should be adding into the letter, because I don't think we put in the letter the efforts that we have been making in terms of having meetings almost weekly and even meetings that I'm not participating in that are occurring yeah, around this great, issue. I think that's a great idea. I mean, okay. somewhere. Yes, we, we actually have it there. We haven't gotten the numbers from Jesse yet about right, that. Right. But I mean, saying that the NIMBY yeah. thing should be really way up there in, in one or okay. two sentences and then you go into the rest of it. All right. Thank you, Christine. Josephine. Um, just on a point that actually you made, Lowell, um, is that actually in the letter that we're sort of recommend, not really recommending, but if there's an option to have them move somewhere else and see before that this committee is open to that, is that actually in this letter? That's been in our last two letters. We should probably, re probably reference it. It's in our last two letters that, so I'll, I'll note that, Justine. Mm -hmm. Okay, my, my only concern about um, relocating in general is just the domino effect that it causes. And as we already know what happened with the skyline, right? I still can't trace these families that so many kids that were going to our schools. So, you know, my concern is what I don't want to see is that, uh, you know, one of the budget hotels is located to, and, and then pushes out a family hotel or something like that. Like, mm -hmm. I just don't want to see that happen. We Thank won't you. let that happen. That's we not the that intent here. We've been that already. Yeah, they're, they're well aware of what, what, what we're thinking, Josephine. Also, for, for the board's information, and Jesse's tracking this down, we are either number three or number four in community boards out of 59 with social service facilities for the homeless in the city. So that is a pretty good record right there. Twee? Um, Maria had just said in passing that she was going to fix Appendix B, so I was just wondering how that was going to be fixed or changed. Um, Thank you, Twee, for asking. So actually, I had to listen through the entire, the meetings are recorded. So I, on YouTube, I go back to YouTube and there's also closed captioning, so that helps. But I listened through the meeting all over again. That's what I actually did. And also, I do remember I should point out, um, yes, Joe, it actually is in a letter about the meetings that we were doing almost weekly. Okay. Um, Mike Noble. Uh, Christine already covered my questions, but I just want to say this is probably one of the finest letters I've seen in all the years. So I think you did a great job. Maria, Maria's smiling. She says thank you. Okay. Katie Stokes. Hey there. Yeah, I think it is uh, an awesome letter. Um, I just had a couple quick, well, two quick uh, sentences I wanted to mention maybe could be improved. Mm -hmm. And then I also really want to reiterate, Lowell, what you said and what Josephine said. I think it's really important to put in the letter that um, that we have, we're, we're not like the other places. We're offering to let them move it into, you know, somewhere else in our district. Okay. Should I give you my little two sentence things right now or, yeah? If, if Katie, if, if, if they're like minor, like wording, we could probably just deal with that over email, it's faster. Perfect, I'll do that. Thank you, Katie. Yep. S Sabrina. An overall or a comment. Is there, um, and this has to do with my work experience in, and working with shelters. Um, I wonder if, as a community, is there any way that we can hold accountable the shelters, in this case, who are COVID shelters, that they have uh, social services. Um, I, I think one of the biggest problems is that they say that they have it, but they really don't, or they're not really um, doing what they're supposed to do. 
Um, so I, I just, I'm curious to just, you know, on accountability, I know DHS is the, is the agency that is in charge of them, but who is supervising them? Who, who, is there any way that we can find, okay, well, where's a record that these people are being, you know, sent to see mental health or, or, or all the, all the requirements that they need to have. Well, um, and I wonder are, are contracted, our contractors of DHS, whether they're for-profit or not-for-profit, and they have voluminous reporting requirements. The problem we're having is they have also said informally in meetings we've had with DHS that the physical buildings are not set up to do the kind of work they would normally do in the congregate shelters. So that's why I was mentioned earlier. Well, I, I, um, I find a really hard time to, to, to think about that, right? Because, well, maybe they cannot do it in the building, but they could outsource it. No, they actually have the staff that do this work, but they, they don't have the counseling rooms, the recreation rooms, the activity but, rooms. But they cannot stuff. source it. They have not been, we think for a moment that this has been planned. There has been no planning here. Right. Yeah, but so, it's been more than six months. Yeah, yeah. That's the point of our letter. So, that's that's the point of our letter. <laughs> Brina, therein lies the frustration, right? There, yeah. Because it should not take six months for the council member staff to go to Metro Baptist Church to say, could you find some rooms for counseling and or activities and or the various things you need to do? This is not planned. And the root of it is DHS is just not taking it as a serious matter. As long as they can have people separate it and they're safe, that's it. And the consequence is we have all of the street issues and the decompensating and the stuff that happens when people are not engaged with mental health and physical health. That's what's happening around us. We're watching a system break down and it's happening in we, our neighborhood. We can talk offline and tell you a little bit about my experience um, because I really, this is exactly what I do. I connect folks with services uh, with mental health, men, most of them for mental illness and, and I know what the problem is, um, but yeah. I, I, as we've said multiple times, the answer we get from DHS is that COVID is a crisis and this is an emergency situation and they've used that as an excuse to not do the kind of things you're asking about, Sabrina. But it shouldn't be an excuse. Well, we it said, shouldn't be, but- We said, they, they've lectured us and let us know we're in a pandemic, as if all of us would not be aware we're in a pandemic. This has struck me over and over as craziness. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Raksha's next. Hey, um, I had a quick question about who this letter is addressed to. So mayor, DHS, and electeds make sense to me. But I was wondering what the purpose of um, addressing the police commissioner and NYPD was. Is there a specific ask in this that NYPD is going to respond to or that we want them to play a role in the neighborhood between the shelters? Just wanted yeah. to know what the ask was specifically yeah. for the commissioner. It's on line 57. It's to coordinate the DHS street outreach and the NYPD public safety enforcement. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? from the board about this letter. Okay, thank you all for your time. Um, item 13 is a basically a pro forma letter. Under our bylaws, we are required to vote in person because we can't vote in person. We will be having the board elections in December online. We are advising the borough president that we're doing this so we can get around any legal requirement that we meet in person under the uh, governor's executive order. Any questions? Jesse, go ahead. I'm going to just add that this is any boards that are uh, running their elections during this time and doing it virtually are, are all doing sort of similar resolutions and letters. So this is just our version of that. So, to, so if people ask how or why was our election done in this way, we have a, a history and a, an understanding of what, what the purpose was. Any questions on that? Okay, um, that are, those are the 13 items that we are voting on. I'm going to turn it over to Mike and Leslie to do our roll call. Same way we've been doing it. If you wanna pull out any item and vote no, you can do so. Otherwise, let them know. Tweez, I saw Tweez hand go up. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I thought we had, I didn't know if we actually covered five. I think that we bundled one through four and then five was nope. for ratification. Five, five, the only difference with five is that it's actually already gone out. It was approved by the executive board um, and it's for ratification by the full board. 
Okay. All right, so Mike and Leslie, the show is yours. Okay, I'll read the names and Leslie will take notes. Uh, Sarah Appleton. Uh, yes, on all. Christine Berthe. Yes, except for. Gwen. Gwen Billig. We're looking for you again this time, Gwen. She was here earlier. <laughs> I looks like her. it I looks. It looks like she stepped. Away. It looks like she stepped away. Come back to her. Okay. Uh, Leslie. Yes, on all. Viren. Yes, on all except for number four. Patricia. She's not with us anymore, I guess, right? No. Jessica. Yes, on all. Dale. I am yes on all. Judith Dayhill. Yes on all. Marty Ducat. Yes on all. Paul Dublin. Yes on all. Tina. Yes on all. Pete. Yes on all. Brett Furfer. Uh, yes on all. El Zora. Yes on all. Wendy. <clears throat> Yes, on all. David Haloka. He's not, not present. Oh, he's not, okay. Frank. Yes, on all. Josephine. Yes, on all. Carrie. Yes, on all. Blake. Yes, on all. Bert. Yes, on all. Christopher. I vote aye on all. Jeffrey. Aye on all. Betty. Betty McIntosh, star six. I'll come back to yes Betty. Yes on all. Okay. Yes on all. Okay. Bet Betty's there. Great. Morgan McLean. Is Morgan with us tonight? I don't think so. I didn't see him. Sarah Mills. Yes, on all. Raksha. Yes, on all. Myself, yes, on all. JD. Yes, on all. Maria. Yes, on all. Alan Oster. Yes, on all. Brad. Yes, on all. Rhonda Patillo. Nope, next. Uh, Twee. Yes on all. Joe. Yes on all. Sabrina. Yes on all. Uh, Dolores. Yes on all. Brian Socal. Yes on all. David Solnick. Yes on all. Katie Stokes. Yes on all. Kit Tollerson. Yes on all. Marty Treat. Yes. Oh. Great. Hector Vasquez. Yes, at all. Uh, Rob Walker. I thought Rob was here. He's on. Yeah, the he was. He's on the phone. Star six, right? Yeah. Rob, it's star six on mute. There he goes. Sorry about that, guys. Yes to all. James Wallace. Harris Pence. Let's get it on. Yes to all. <laughs> David Warren. Yay on all. Leslie Williams. Yes on all. No to four. Colin Wright. Colin yes, on, yeah, uh, yes on all. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I think that leaves Gwen Billig again, yes? Oh, you need me. Uh, well, I'll get to you. <laughs> You're last. Did you get Dolores? Dolores, did you vote? Dolores, here she is. Okay, she sorry, did. I missed that. She did. Well, okay. Gwen, I guess, is present and not voting. Oh, she's there. I see the top of her head. <laughs> well, Gwen, 
you've got to mail in your uh, your vote sheet immediately. I'll let you know if she submits her vote sheet. Everybody needs to submit their vote sheet. Okay. And then uh, Lowell, that's you last. Yes to all. Okay. All right. That concludes the roll call vote on items one through 13. Is there any new business we need to take up? Hearing um, none, I'll entertain a note motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second it. Second. Everyone enjoy the debate. Thank Thanks you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Your vote sheets. Bye guys. Vote sheets. 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 Okay, I've worked on everything and I've already emailed my email. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs>